All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's installment of the uh, Corona Developer Meeting. Let's go ahead and uh, get into the uh, the update slide that I have for today. All right. So real quick uh, announcements and then uh, status updates. Um, the next development meeting is currently TBD because August 7th, which was the original date I had in mind, um, is, uh, is SIGCOM. So I'm going to be attending that in um, in Sydney. So I'm thinking we'll probably have to bump the meeting. I'm not sure if, if we'll go, you know, if we'll do it in, you know, late July or later in August. Not sure, but I will post to the uh, to the list and let you guys know um, what the plan is going to be for that. Um, the next switch meeting will be in a week on July 10th. Hopefully Carlos will have some interesting stuff to talk about. So if you're interested in that, feel free to tune in. Same time, same room, everything. So and that should be pretty straightforward. Um, and then I think I sent a uh, calendar link around if people want to add this stuff to their uh, to their Google calendars or potentially other calendars as well. Um, all right, so moving on to status updates. So I've been doing a little bit of work on uh, components for White Rabbit um, and then also just a little bit of ruminating on um, PTM and uh, R-tile, R-tile support. All right, so for White Rabbit, there's a bunch of odds and ends that need to be implemented. Um, <clears throat> I guess I put this kind of in order that I'm going to be working on stuff, more or less. Um, but I think all of this stuff is going to be necessary for White Rabbit to work. Uh, so one of them is that we need to, when you get what's called DDMTD working, and DDMTD is how, is one method for doing very precise uh, relative phase measurements between different clocks. And for DDMTD to work, you need a clock that is offset by a uh, specific and very small amount from the uh, from the reference clock. It's basically with DDMTD, you're mixing the two clocks together and looking at the difference frequency between, between the two. So the closer in frequency this helper clock is, the uh, more um, the more precisely you can measure the phase because you sort of expand it out more in time. Um, and then you can just use a simple counter to, to measure the phase offset. So I need to figure out how to generate the DDMTD helper clock. On a lot of the White Rabbit hardware, they use like a separate tunable oscillator to do that, um, which, you know, has some advantages um, because you can get a really clean signal that way. But the disadvantage is you actually need this additional oscillator on the board, and most FPGA boards don't have one of those. Um, they might have one tunable oscillator, but they probably don't have two. Um, so I need to figure out how to generate that inside the FPGA, potentially using FPGA primitives. And uh, I've just implemented something using the, uh, the MMCMs that I'll talk about in a minute um, to, to do that. Once I have the helper clock, then I can implement DDMTD itself which you can use to measure the relative um, phases between two different clocks. Now, ostensibly, it should be possible to do this between clocks that are running at different frequencies with a defined relationship, um, but it's unclear exactly how that measurement works in terms of, you know, if you get, because um, the edges don't necessarily align, right? They'll align every, you know, n clock cycles potentially if there's a defined relationship um but outside of that how do you define the phase not sure so i got to do some ruminating on that because that's something we'll have to deal with um if uh, we're running at different different um different frequencies right if you have a, a link at 10g and a link at 1g well one of them is going to have a, a frequency of uh, you know 125 megahertz the other one's going to have a frequency of you know 156 or 161 so how do you relate those two together if you want to transfer you know, the timing from one link to another. It's um, it's a little bit unclear at the moment. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I need to take a look at is, um, you know, is it possible to run, you know, 1000 base X on a transceiver configure for 10G? Because a lot of White Rabbit stuff is at 1G. So uh, if we can make that work on existing boards without having to um, give up the capability of, you know, running at one gig and 10 gig um, on the same quad, that would be useful. Um, and there's some boards that have other restrictions that that cause problems here. So it's uh, it's useful to to set things up, you know, in this way such that we don't need to actually reconfigure the transceiver for 10 gig, but just you know handle it in the logic. 
Um, so I think I've talked about this a little bit before. I got a few ideas for how to do this, but you know, need to sit down and, and actually make it work. Um, once we have a lot of those components, then um, it's going to be time to work on some higher level stuff. Like basically for, for synchronous ethernet, the idea is to transfer the, um, uh, the receiver covered clock over to the transmit clock and you phase lock it such that the whole network is running at the same frequency. So White Rabbit builds on top of that with the PTP style time synchronization and a bunch of, you know, calibration measurement stuff. Um, but you have to be able to, uh, to do this locking where the, the TX clock is locked to the, uh, to the RX recovered clock. Um, so that'll be an important piece to get working. And then I also need to go make sure that all the time stamping components are working properly and actually giving accurate, you know, sub nanosecond resolution timestamps. I suspect right here, they're maybe working down to the nanosecond or so they are providing fractional bits, but I don't think those fractional bits are particularly accurate. So if we're going to do white rabbit, then all that has to be, has to be accurate. And potentially there needs to be a slightly different method for, um, for distributing the internal PTP clock with the, the necessary accuracy. So once I have a lot of the other foundational components there, then we'll have to take a look at that. Um, and then another component that I might need to look into at some point is, um, you know, how to slew the clock frequency for the transceivers without an external tunable oscillator. Um, Cause it seems like it should be possible to do this. And um, there was a timing conference in San Diego a couple of months ago and I was talking to some of the, the Saffron guys, um, and one of their products uses a Xilinx FPGA for uh, for White Rabbit, and apparently they're not using any kind of onboard or on-card PLL. They're doing everything inside the FPGA. So it's definitely possible to do this with, um, you know, reasonable performance. So the question is, you know, how, how to make it work. Um, I got a couple of ideas, but it's going to require some some tinkering, I think, to make sure that um, that it's actually going to work and to get all the kinks worked out of it. All right, so what I have been working out over the past few days here is to get, um, is to use an MMCM for producing the, the uh, DDMTD helper clock, basically the first bullet point on there. And the this uses the MMCM's phase shift capability to synthesize a controlled uh, and small offset. So for example, you might offset the clock by one part in two to the 16. Um, so that means, you know, for 65,536 cycles of one clock, you get 65,537 cycles of the other clock or 65,535, right? You either add a cycle or you remove a cycle mm -hmm. over that period. Um, the one option for doing this is to basically build a PLL around the MMCM. You know, you divide the clocks down, you know, you look at the um, difference in phase between the divided clocks, you feed that back into the MMCM and control the phase shifter. But... Um, and the uh, the the folks from MLE talked about you know their setup for doing that at uh, the White Rabbit um, workshop earlier this year back in March. Um, but when I was thinking about how the uh, the MMCMs work and the phase shift capability, I realized that it might actually be possible to do this open loop. So instead of building another PLL which has its own dynamics, its own control loop, and potentially a bunch of logic that's you know doing some some various computations here. Well, maybe it would be possible to do this um, entirely just with an MMCM and with a, a very simple state machine without needing another phase detector and whatnot. Um, and I also need to investigate, you know, okay, if we're going to use an MMCM, how does this actually work for for DDMTD um, in terms of the uh, the high level performance? Um, as it doesn't make sense to jump through all these hoops only to have you know DDMTD not work properly because the MMCMs are too noisy or something. So, um, first step is okay. Can we just make this um, make this open loop synthesis thing work? All right. So, how does the phase measurement or the phase adjustment work in in the MMCM? Well, there's basically two input pins. One of them is called PSEN for phase shift enable, and the other one is PS Inc Dec for increment or decrement. Um, the idea is to give it a one cycle pulse on PSEN to shift the um, the phase shifter by one tap. And PS ink deck is which way do you shift it, right? If you set that high, it goes one way. If you set it low, it goes the other way. Each shift takes 12 cycles. So you can't shift every single cycle. When you shift, you got to wait 12 cycles before you can shift again. Uh, and each tap is um, 156th of the VCO period. 
So if the VCO is running at one gigahertz, then one tap is one fifty-sixth of a nanosecond. And I'll go through an example, just real straightforward on the next slide to get a better idea of, of how this works. Um, but what I realized is that the phase shifter clock and the state machine that's generating PSEN is driven by the MMCM input clock, then you can apply the phase shift deterministically and produce a precise frequency offset without needing some sort of a control loop. Because we're not talking about like a VCO where you don't know exactly what you're going to get by adjusting the control voltage. We're talking about, you know, very specific. You, you step it, you get 156th of the, the VCO period. So all you need to do is, you know, trigger the PSEN pulses uh, on the right cycles. Um, and you can get over the long term a very precise um, offset. Now, obviously, it's a limited offset. You can't pick whatever you want. You can only offset by a handful of PPM, but um, that's the idea. So, so a quick example here. If we take an MMCM that's configured 125 megahertz in times eight multiplier up to a one gigahertz VCO, and then, you know, divide by eight for 125 megahertz out, uh, that'll give you a phase shift step size of one nanosecond over 56, or, you know, one fifty-sixth of a nanosecond. Um, so if one cycle of the output clock is eight nanoseconds, right, 125 megahertz, um, that means you need, you know, that corresponds to 448 of these um, of these taps, of these steps, right, because you need to shift 56 times to get one nanosecond, but we need eight, so you need eight times that at 448. Um, so to make an offset of, for example, one part in, in 2 to the 16, you need to shift 448 times every you know, two to 16 clock cycles. Um, so what's the maximum offset that you can achieve? Well, it's a question of how long or how many clock cycles does it take to shift by one clock cycle? So you need to shift by 448. You can only shift every 12. So, you know, one over, you know, one clock cycle over 448 times 12 clock cycles, that gives you about 186 PPM. So you get a tuning range of about 186 PPM with this, with this configuration. So you can, well, I guess it'd be double that, right? You either do plus that or minus that. So I have here just a very simple Verilog code that I wrote that um, that can generate the um, the PSEN pulses um, to satisfy just any, you know, rational fraction you can come up with. So in this case, you specify the numerator and the denominator. So the numerator would be 448, the denominator would be 65,536. Um, on every cycle, you um, you add the numerator. If it exceeds the denominator value, then you subtract off the denominator and you set you know PSEN to one. And this keeps the the remainder in the count register such that over the long term you'll get um, an accurate fraction out of this thing. Um, so I went ahead and I built um, a module which you can specify the numerator and the denominator in uh, parameters and loaded two copies of this on an FPGA board, one shifting up and the other shifting down um, by, you know, one part in two to the 16. And um, basically it seems to do exactly what it's supposed to do. This is one of these things that once I got Vivado to build the darn thing, because it kept complaining about how I was connecting up the, the clocks internally and whatnot, I had to set some dedicated route constraints to make it work. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, the first time I actually decided to run on the FPGA, or the first time Vivado actually built the bit file, I loaded it on and it ran and uh, seemed to work uh, perfectly. So um, I have a VC118. I've got a couple of cards on here that let me access um, some of the clock output connections on the uh, on the FMCs. So I can take that and route it over to a, uh, an external piece of test equipment. And one part in 2 to the 16 is about we had a 1,907 hertz, and well, that's exactly what we see on the frequency counter here. These are in, you know, offset mode, so it's, it's actually measuring, you know, 125 point something uh, megahertz and then subtracting. Um, but the upshift and the downshift do seem to be producing the correct output frequency. And then the question is, even if it's producing the right frequency, the question is, you know, how clean is that? Um, this is an area that I'm a little bit less familiar with. I did take this and whack it into my spectrum analyzer to see what's going on. And I noticed something kind of interesting. Um, I was expecting to see similar performance between shifting up and shifting down, but it seems like there is 
something going on. I don't know if I have, you know, some bad assumption about, you know, how to generate the PSEN pulse and I'm doing something wrong or if there, this is just something inherent to how the, the MMCMs work. But um, shifting down seems to produce a, a spur and shifting up, it doesn't. So um, I've got three screenshots here from my, uh, from my spectrum analyzer. The center is at 125 megahertz. So if we shift down, um, that peak ends up exactly where we expect it to be. But then we have another peak over here um, at the uh, at the upshift location. But this is like 40 dB down, and everything down here is about 60 dB. So yeah, this is a bit of a head scratcher. But then if you switch it to shifting up, right, this peak appears at the same point, right, 125.0183, right? So it's the same same exact spot as where the spur is, but we don't get the spur at the lower frequency. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on with this thing, but I guess the, the simple thing we can do is just make sure we always shift uh, up in frequency uh, for the helper clock, and then that, that should work. Um, but I guess the question is, you know, are all of these other little peaks down here going to be causing any problems, or is there anything else going on? I'm not sure, so I'm going to have to I'm going to look at a couple different things. One of them is to potentially try following up with a uh, another MMCM or PLL, which might clean things up a little bit. Um, another possibility, well, not, the, the ultimate test is just to test with DDMTD and see what the DDMTD performance looks like. Because um, if DDMTD works, despite some spikes, then I guess we're okay. If it doesn't work, then, you know, maybe uh, another approach is required. But uh, so far, this looks this looks pretty promising. Um, so yeah, moving on to, uh, PTM and other stuff. I haven't done much on these fronts, but, uh, I'll go over this just at a high level pretty quick here. So, um, if you're going to be doing white rabbit in, you know, on a Nick, it also makes sense to be able to precisely synchronize the time, uh, to the host as well. So PTP and white rabbit and whatnot, they work nicely on the network side, but you run into, you know, on, on the PCIe side, unless you want to operate in, you know, sort of NTP land where you don't have any hardware timestamps and you're subject to queuing delays and whatnot, um, you potentially need a little bit of help from the hardware. Um, so PTM is basically PTP for PCIe. And if you can implement PTM, then you can perform, you can transfer time to and from the host uh, much more accurately than you can just using, you know, normal MMIO operations like, um, you know, what most NICs do right now what, and what Corundum does right now. Um, but the trick is for PTM, you actually need hardware that supports PTM. And uh, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, so for Xilinx cores, that's going to be a long-term thing to make it work. Uh, for Intel cores, aside from the R tile, it's probably not going to be possible to support PTM. Um, but I have a uh, an Agilex i-series dev kit which has an R tile that natively supports PTM. And uh, the folks at the Open Compute Project provided a motherboard that uh, supports PTM as well. So um, once I have the uh, the cycles to sit down and hammer out the, the details, it should be possible to um, to bring this thing up and get Corundum running on it. And then we'll have at least a data point with PTM working. Now, can we run, run White Rabbit on this particular board? I don't know. Um, can we run PTP on this particular board? I also don't know because it uses the F tile, which um, um, I'm not sure how PTP works on those things exactly right now. So uh, we'll we'll take it one at a time. But uh, that's the only board that I have at the moment that supports PTM. So we'll start with that. Um, so yeah, the short term is to port, you know, to the R tile and to integrate the R tile native PTM support into Corundum. And then the long term is to look at um, PTM support on other devices, in particular Xilinx devices. But um, this is potentially going to be a pretty non-trivial project to make it work. But you know, we'll see. Um, for getting things running on the R tile, the R tile is similar to the P tile, and I was just taking a look at the uh, documentation recently. Um, for the data side we should be able to pretty much work out of the box because the code that I wrote previously is pretty well um, uh, pretty well parameterized and I think it will support four segments. Um, the, the, the R tile can run 
with a couple different configurations. It can run with two segments as well, depending on the uh, the bus configuration. Um, but the flow control is different, so I need to sit down and figure out, you know, how to do the TX and RX flow control properly, um, because the way those credits get handed over um, has been totally reorganized, and there's a, a more complex process for doing the flow control initialization. So um, the plan that I have is to start out with either Gen 3 by 16 or Gen 4 by 8, whatever gives me, you know, 512 bits, you know, in two segments, uh, get the flow control hammered out, um, and then take a look at um, getting PTM integrated and then moving up to, you know, wider link widths and faster data rates. And the interesting thing about the R tile, I mentioned this before probably, is that you can actually do uh, Gen 4 by 16 as 1024 bits at 250 megahertz, which I think is going to be a lot more doable from a timing standpoint than trying to run at uh, at Gen 5 or even Gen 4 by 16 on a P tile, which, which also runs at like 450 megahertz or something, which is a bit of a tall order on an FPGA. Um, all right, so that about rounds it out there. Right, and then I got the, uh, the development set up from uh, the folks at Meta. They provided uh, a, a CPU and a motherboard and um, Intel previously provided a board. So uh, I might be assuming I get this working. So I'm gonna be working on this over the next couple of months and hopefully we'll be able to demo something at the, the OSP Summit and potentially uh, ISPCS as well. So not sure if anybody's planning on attending those, but um, I, I might see you there depending. Um, let's see. And I guess I, I talked about the, the White Rabbit Nick last time, but there hasn't been any we don't we don't have the uh, the initial prototype back from the fab yet, so there's nothing to add to that uh, at the moment. So I think that about rounds it out for status updates for today. If anyone has any questions or comments, go ahead and fire away, or you know anything you want to discuss. And thanks for uh, for tuning in today. But I think you're doing an excellent job with the white rabbit part. I mean, it looks very interesting. I, I will have to review the video again, do, but uh, you know, everything. Just... But that seems like very, very nice. I mean... Yeah, I mean, still got a lot of work to do, but uh, it's it's always nice when you you put something on the board and it actually works. You know, <laughs> even if it's something yeah, relatively I mean, those... simple. So. I mean, just being able to see it on the measurement equipment and so is quite promising. Right. I mean, you know, as they say, the, the proof is in the pudding, right? You got to put the whole thing together before you know if it's going to work right. So um, yep. we have one one little piece working. Now we got to put together some other stuff. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll have more to talk about at the, the next meeting in terms of uh, bits and pieces for, for White Rabbit. Cool. So did anyone else have any questions or comments about anything or um, ideas, stuff you want to build on top of Corundum, anything like that? And uh, well, maybe I can comment some things related with the switch. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, as some of you know that we are now like trying to evaluate uh, the switch performance. So um, for that, we are exploring some main tools. Uh, don't know if software, hardware, to see how we can actually test the switch and see how it performs. If it doesn't break or yeah, uh, take some KPIs related with the switch. So in that sense, I don't know if any of you are aware of any tools because we are trying to explore tools like T-Rex or we are also looking to see if we can build maybe our own packet generator on HDL. I had this past month a student that was working on a, yeah, on a bachelor thesis and he has developed a, yeah, a packet generator which is now available on GitHub and I can maybe share uh, the link uh, on, on Sulip. So that you can see the work that, that he has been doing. Um, yeah, I was just wanted to ask if you know any tools or anything that can be used to test uh, a switch. I mean, just 
switch. It doesn't have to be the switch that we have been putting together, but whatever switch, also commercial switches. Yeah, because I guess we have looked at a couple of different um, possible solutions, and T-Rex I thought was going to be a pretty promising one, but Carlos has been running into some issues with T-Rex in terms of generating a very large number of flows. It's kind of perplexing. You think if you if you go to try to generate a large number of flows and you end up with less flows than you expect, that kind of makes sense. But somehow Carlos is seeing more flows than, than he's asking for. So yeah. um, I, I, I need to check some of this stuff, uh, having some TCP dump or something to see the actual frame that has been sent. But I, uh, one college of my university that is has been also working with T-Rex has also told me another alternative to to generate the flows in this stateless uh, mode of T-Rex. So, uh, so I will give it a shot to see if uh, changing the way of launching the, the T-Rex console or the scripts uh, helps it. I mean, using like the, let's say, easy way doesn't seem to worry that opening the, the console and launching a script where you have all the flows defined and you set the, the bandwidth that you need doesn't seem to be like working. Maybe it's just a switch uh, problem or something that we need to check with the, some uh, uh, traffic captures. But yeah, maybe doing it like uh, using the other way, using one like API that has T-Rex, maybe it helps. I don't know. So at least we have another you, thing to, to try. Uh, are you using uh, the PCAP file? Are you replaying the PCAP file or are you... And you have... We are not using uh, captures. We are just, uh, we have a, we define using like this SCAPI library in Python, the flows. I mean, I mean, I have found like two different ways of defining different, I mean, we want to change, for example, information about the header of the frame. For example, let's say the source MAC, mm -hmm. the source MAC address. And for that, they have found like two ways of doing that. You can, for example, define, I don't know, hundreds of uh, flows, each one with its own source MAC address, or you can, uh, define one single flow, but you can like right. uh, change in real time, frame by frame, in a frame by frame basis, change the source MAC address by, for example, incrementing it uh, by one or random in a, in, a, in a random way. Or the other thing I thought is, okay, maybe we can mix both approaches and have, for example, 100 flows that changes uh, the MAC address over a range of 100 values so that you can generate like 10,000 different flows uh, of different type of so, frames. But and so, when reaching yeah, K, it, it saturates. It's, it's yeah, just that so, you, you get an unexpected behavior of the Rex. Yeah. So so the only so the, I found an interesting paper who who has worked on this. Uh, it's called Moongen. So what they did is they extended packet gen and they did exactly what you're saying. They they made it like on a packet level you can change you can modify stuff, which packet gen doesn't allow. Right. Okay. Can, so, can you write but it, it's the name on the chat, please? Also do, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I heard about but this I, one myself. I just completely forgot about it. Yeah, Moon Gen. Okay. But it's, it's just like it's, Moon, like, I don't you think... know, yeah. Son of the Moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah. okay. But it's not uh, updated. So I was thinking to use it, but... Uh... Man, yeah, two years ago. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't think it will follow... Yeah. Oh wait, the, okay, the, okay. so it was created ten years ago, but the last pull request was merged two years ago. Interesting. Yeah, that's been around for a little while. Okay, yeah, I will give it a try. Yeah, thank you, Krishna. Go ahead and pop that in the uh, references. There we go. Boink, Moongen. All right, post that on on Zulip for future reference. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, yeah that's, that's definitely uh... worth trying. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was also thinking on the same lines actually. Uh, but that's the thing, right? So you will be trading performance if you are going to do some modifications on the packet level because you are kind of incurring some additional latency on the yeah, packet level. I mean, level. I guess it it depends on on your point of view, right? Like you could certainly write out a pcap file and play it back, but yes, you know, how much space do you have for a massive pcap file, and how quickly can you play it back, right? There's going to be a trade-off somewhere where it might actually be faster to generate the data on the fly 
than to try to play back a PCAP file. Where that trade off right. is, I don't know, but, um, you know, especially if you're talking about, you know, hundreds of gigabits per second, <laughs> if you're going to make a big okay. PCAP file, where are you going to store it? And once you reach yeah. the end of the PCAP file, what are you going to do? Are you going to loop it? Um, you know, if you generate your traffic dynamically, then you can just keep going and then going and going. Um, you don't need to worry about, you know, loops. Um, yeah, the other thing I was telling Carlos is that, you know, we might even need to use multiple different techniques for testing some of this stuff, right? Some things, maybe it makes sense to do something like, um, you know, T-Rex and run at line rate. Other things, maybe we don't really need to run at line rate. We can run slower right. Um, right. and use a, a different technique, right? Because, you know, taking the limit in the other direction, you could just use Scapy <laughs> and generate the packets directly from Python, however you want. It would be dirt slow, but, you know, you know exactly what you're getting. So, um, you know, somewhere along that continuum is probably the, yeah. uh, the correct solution, but uh, we haven't found it yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 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 yeah, go, 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 go. No, no, maybe I am also misusing T-Rex. I mean, I'm kind of new using it, so it's been only like a few days working with it. So maybe I am also misunderstanding something or... I also have to play around a little bit. Yeah, more. user error is entirely possible. I mean, I'm not familiar with it either. So this is a mm. learning experience for everybody. Yeah. But yeah, the idea oh, with T-Rex so... is that we actually have a stack of uh, servers in the CSE machine room. So we can load those up with Mellanox Nix and plug in the FPGA to that and just totally hammer on it. Um, so that, that was kind of the idea with T-Rex. If we do something that requires FPGAs or something, then that's you know, potentially a little more complicated to, uh, to implement. Um, but yeah. So, so we were, we were kind of playing with the TCP server. So the whole FPGA becomes like a TCP server. And now you cannot run DPDK because, uh, you kind of, uh, there's, uh, you kind of need to calculate the sequence numbers and things like that, because you don't know, because either the TCP well, server you, you mean itself. You can't run DPDK or you can't run like a uh, stateless packet generation. Yeah, you cannot run a stateless packet generation. Okay. Because I know I know so, people make TCP stacks in DPDK. Yes. Yeah, either you do that or we finally end up using a Go, Go program to just uh, do it because, uh, or, or maybe use another FPGA as a TCP client and just try it out. But yeah, well, that, that's actually the other thing I was talking to Carlos about is that at some point, maybe it even makes sense to use an intermediate packet switch, right? And you could use multiple NICs or multiple components to feed data into something. Um, hmm. This is this is definitely more complicated if you're trying to test like a switch because, you know, if you want to put something on each port, that thing is really blow up <laughs> quickly. But if you're yeah. just testing like a, you know, a NIC or middle box or something like that, then... Yeah, I could definitely see making a setup like that where you could have multiple servers connected to it through a switch, all, you know, sending traffic in, in different configurations or just all sending traffic so you get a, a larger amount. Um, and that would certainly reduce the the requirements on what each individual server is doing. So you could probably get away with, you know, I'm not going to say Python, but... You know, definitely much more traditional software for the packet generation and load generation. Right. Because if you didn't have a switch, then you got to do everything on one server. And that's, uh, you're potentially going to be spending yeah. a lot of time doing performance tuning, which you would, hmm. would rather not have to deal with that. <clears throat> uh, Alex, by the way, uh, can you can you check this link? Uh, this is the stuff I was talking about. Uh... Yeah, I'll take a quick peek here. As soon as AMD site loads here. Oh, okay. So this seems like it's only going to apply to certain dev boards. It says the failure yeah. is seen using the JTAG only configuration mode. But I think on most boards, either the mode pins are not going to be accessible. 
um, and they're going to be hardwired to QSPI or something. Um, or it's going to be like a dev board, like a VC-118. So I think on a U-280, I presumably that's just hardwired for QSPI. I don't even think they have a dip switch for that. But on the VC-118, they probably do, or jumpers or something. I don't know. Okay. That would probably simplify <laughs> things. I... The other thing I will say um, is that if you connect to the hardware manager from Bovado, um, right. they actually show under the, the properties, under registers, you can see the states of the mode pins. It's a super okay. useful debugging technique. So you can look in there and go, okay, it's set for QSPI. Oh, it's set for BPI. Oh, it's set for JTAG. Um, you know, independent yeah. of naturally looking at the physical board. So I've definitely done that a couple of times to, to help figure out, you know, reverse engineering a board. How is this thing loading? Oh, it's BPI okay. <laughs> or whatever. Um, so yeah, you can check that because th this seems to only apply to, uh, to JTAG only. So if it's set for, um, um, if it's set for QSPI, then you should be fine. Presumably, assuming I'm reading this correctly. It also says, oh, JTAG mode is always available independent of the mode pin settings. Yeah, that, that was one thing I was kind of scratching my head over is why do they even have a JTAG configuration mode that you can select? Because you can always use the JTAG to reset the thing and load a configuration. You don't need to change the mode pin settings uh, to go into JTAG. The, the only yeah. so I, I I have run into a couple of issues with this I mean it, so so I guess the main thing is that you can put it in a jtag mode so it never loads the flash um which is a potentially <laughs> useful debugging thing but you could do that by okay. you know disconnecting the flash or something as well you don't necessarily have to change the mode pins I have run into issues I think with um with zinc devices and weird behavior between um, setting it for jtag mode and setting it for like a uh, booting from the SD card. Like, if you don't set it to boot from the SD card, obviously it doesn't boot from the SD card. But if you set it to boot from the SD card and then you load it via JTAG, sometimes it doesn't work in weird ways. So, um, I think I, I got tripped up by that a while ago trying to test Corundum on a probably the ZC106 or something in PCIe mode and it wasn't working. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Finally, I I tried changing the, the, the dip switches to change the, the boot mode to, you know, so it wouldn't try to boot from the SD card. Then it worked. Like, why does it make any difference? But uh, but that's also a zinc device. That's not a, um, that's not a normal FPGA. So and those things have a completely different boot process. Have you ever bricked an FPGA board? Um... I've definitely messed up the flashing a few times with uh, with Corundum, um, but you know, I never bricked it because you know, okay, fine, we just plug in a JTAG cable and fix the problem. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. Um, yeah, I, I, at one point I messed up something in the um, basically the the configuration registers that are used to access some of the internal. Um, registers and I messed up something in that access code and it was causing I can't remember if it was a readback issue or yeah it, it might have just actually been causing issues with the with the readback uh, so every time I would try to run the uh, the firmware update it would fail <laughs> to uh to flash the thing correctly um and I can't remember if that actually resulted in a bricked board that I then had to go fix via jtag but you know um yeah, yeah, I've I've had to deal with that a couple of times. Um, oh, oh, here here's a fun one. Here's a fun one. I figured out how you can get the how you can hang the configuration logic. I think I think I figured out at least two different ways of how you can hang the configuration logic on the FPGA by configuring okay. things wrong in the bitstream. Um, one of them is that if you tell it to use the uh, external um, external memory interface clock, and there isn't one. Then it'll hang because it'll switch to it and then it's not running <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. so that doesn't work yeah. the other thing yeah. is that if you tell it to use uh the the the, the next boot address of the current bitstream yeah right. 
that'll hang. <laughs> so, um, so the so the full. So the I, I've, 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 I've made both of those mistakes, and it's easy to 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 repair that. You just go in with uh, yeah. with Vivado and reflash the thing over JTAG. <laughs> so yeah, I've definitely screwed up the flash contents, but bricking is in. You got to throw out the board. You know, I, I haven't done that yet. Yet. <laughs> so the so the first the first case happened to me as well. Uh, I changed uh, microcontrollers more to an external oscillator, fuse bits, and now it couldn't find the uh, clock, and so I had to jump a wire to temporarily provide a clock and then change the fuse bits. <laughs> Well, as long as you don't have to like provide the clock with a re with a button or something, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I. Uh, w whenever you're dealing with things like fuse bits or e fuses, that's when you need to be careful. Like with the Xilinx devices, I've never touched the e fuse because if I mess oh. that up, that's going to be bad. <laughs> yeah, because and you can put encryption keys and stuff like that in the e fuse. Um, but yeah, I've never had a need to do that. Never bothered touching that. <laughs> um yeah, I think it's less of an issue for the for the Xilinx devices, but some of the Intel ones with their SDM and whatnot potentially have a more complicated uh procedure on certain boards for for actually loading bit streams on there. You have to do like a whole initialization process and generate keys, load keys into the device and do that in a, like a permanent way. I'm like, okay, I I don't want to risk breaking this board <laughs> by loading a key in there and screwing up the process. So, eh. yeah, it would be nice if you could just disable those security features and just use a darn FPGA. But uh, I think I, I think I have one board that was like that. Fortunately, I didn't buy it. Somebody sent it to me. <laughs> so <laughs> that one is just going to collect dust until we figure out how to, um, until I have time to, uh, to attack it again and see if there's a, a solution for that. So what are the Intel pack cards? Yeah, got to be careful with some of those things. Just in terms of if, if you're going to acquire one, it might not be usable. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't think that's really going to be a major concern for what you're what you're what you're working on. And if, yeah. if you do get it into an unbootable state, well, you know, just go into JTAG and fix it. Well, actually, yeah. so the bigger issue that I've run into is not bricking the board so much as weird interactions between the board and the host machine. Most computers just seem to have absolutely terrible, you know, UEFI BIOS stuff. And the problem that a lot of machines seem to be guilty of is that if they detect that there's a card in a slot based on the present pins, but the card doesn't enumerate, they will like mark the slot as bad and never try enumerating it again. Even if you shut down the machine and turn it back on, it won't re-enumerate. So I've had to do this on a number of machines where, you know, I screw up loading a design on the FPGA, I reboot the machine, it doesn't enumerate the card. Shut it down, turn it on, it doesn't enumerate. Shut it down, turn it on, it doesn't enumerate. I have to pull the card out, turn the machine on, shut it down, put the card back in, turn it on, and then it enumerates. It's like... The, so uh, the, the, the firmware developers are too stupid to just like, even if this didn't to, to like, why are they even saving this information? How long does it take to probe the slot and see if there's a card there every time it boots? So the PCI hard logic manages that, right? No, it doesn't. Like it manages that you kind of maintain that uh, timing constraint. No, this is a problem in the system firmware. There's nothing to do with the card. Mm -hmm. Because it's the, the system firmware that's responsible for bringing up all the PCIe links during boot. And it basically it gets into a state where it doesn't even attempt to bring up a link for some reason. I don't know why, but it just doesn't even attempt to do it. And you have to kind of kickstart it into doing a more comprehensive bring up procedure by removing the card, booting it with the slot empty, and then putting the card back in and booting it again. And then it'll work. It's like, and multiple machines have this problem. So it's not, um, it's not in, you know, one, it's not like, oh, it's only Dell machines, just like several manufacturers. It's quite annoying because there's a lot of stuff that you can fix if you have like remote power supply and IPMI and whatnot. But if you have to physically take the effing card out of the slot, 
Otherwise, it doesn't detect it. That's like, Ugh. <clears throat> I don't know what to do about that. Actually, one thing I have not tried is like resetting the CMOS um, thing, right? Because you might be able to do that. I'll have to yeah. try that. Next time, next time it gets stuck like that. The other issue that I've run into is where if you switch cards, like you shut the computer down, you switch to a different card to boot it back up, sometimes it won't enumerate at the full link rate. Either it won't enumerate all the lanes or it won't enumerate at the full at the full speed. Like it'll enumerate at Gen 2 instead of Gen 3. And what I think is happening is similar. It detects that there was a card there before and there's still a card there now. So we're just going to use the equalization settings that we figured out the last time. And the equalization settings are wrong because the card's different. <laughs> And then not all the lanes work. And the solution for that is the same. You take it out, you boot the card, or you boot the machine without the card, you put the card back in, you boot it up again, and then it works. It's like, uh, quite annoying. So I've run into stuff like that, but it has nothing to do with the, the FPGAs. It's, this is a firmware problem on the hosts. And then also not to mention all the times where you go... <laughs> <laughs> where you go try to reprogram the FPGA over JTAG and the whole machine reboots. <laughs> I've run into that before. What? How, oh. how come? So what? servers will have, again, firmware checking, you know, the status of various devices. And if they get an error, like, oh, this PCI Express device disappeared. Ah, I don't know what's going on. Let's reboot. <laughs> um. So... Yeah, I don't know if there's any way you can change that in the firmware, but um, I have discovered a way of, of twiddling the configuration bits in the PCIe config space of the the bridge that the device is connected to, uh, to not report those errors up to the, the system firmware. So if you do that, you got to do that every time you reboot the machine, um, then it will prevent the, the thing from rebooting itself. So... This, this doesn't guess, seem to be a problem it, with desktop computers, but there's definitely a few servers and workstations that uh, that do that. In my guess, in my case, instead of like rebooting the machine, it got blocked. So oh, like it hung, hung, yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, I had to run, for example, your uh, SH uh, script that you have uh, in the VLA PCI repository. Mm -hmm. Before programming oh, it, the, the disabled not... fatal error thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's going to yeah. be dependent on the on the machine. Like this, so this is one thing I really like about those seventy nine twenties. They don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that that other workstation machine that I brought over, that Lenovo thing, the P nine twenty, whatever. It does that. <laughs> if you reprogram the FPGA, it reboots. I yeah, can't remember reboots it, but it, like it flashes thing, some angry thing, error thing message thing. on the front. It's like ah, oh. <laughs> yeah. It's quite annoying, but yeah, that that script works on that too to to prevent that and the um. The firmware update tool for Corundum, um, it has code in there that also pokes those registers. So if you use the MQNIC FW to reboot the card, it will clear those bits during the process to hopefully not reboot the uh, the machine. <laughs> but it doesn't help you if you're doing like an initial load over JTAG, right? If you get an Alveo card, you stick it in a computer, you can't use MQNIC FW because it's an Alveo card running the Alveo's, um, you know, bitstream. You plug in the JTAG, Pull up Vivado, connect to the card, everything looks good. Hit program, server reboots. Oh. <laughs> <It's only. laughs> and then that ties into the other problem. The server reboots. Oh, hey, now this FPGA is not configured, so there's nothing in that slot. Ah, shoot. Now you got to pull the card out, reboot the server, put the card back in. <laughs> An infinite loop. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that makes it complicated to do the um you know load via jtag and then use do a warm reboot and use mqnic fw to flash it you you might just have to flash it from Vibato and then do the whole rigmarole of taking the card out and then it'll work <laughs> it's annoying and i believe those those uh, server cpus takes a long time to really boot right it takes extremely long time it's dependent on the server, and that's all firmware. Terribly written firmware. <laughs> it doesn't take long for the CPU to boot, but these things tend to do all sorts of... The firmware does a whole bunch of checks and things, potentially, and those checks can take a long time. It seems like newer servers are less bad than old ones. Um, we definitely had some servers that took like 10 minutes just to freaking post. Once they finish posting, then they boot up pretty quick, but uh, yeah. 
Some of the newer ones are I, I'm, I'm not even using a server. I'm using a thread ripper and it takes a long time, really long time. <laughs> it takes, mm. I don't dare to boot it. Yeah, that's that's kind of annoying. That's a, one of the workstation CPUs, presumably, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's a pain. Yeah, and all that's all that's firmware. Like I have a couple of um, I don't have Threadripper, but I have a couple of AMD Epic um machines, server motherboards, and they boot up. I mean, they take a couple minutes, but it's like five minutes tops. You know, not really a big deal. Um. But yeah, you know, we've we've definitely historically had some servers that take like ten or fifteen minutes or something to boot up. <laughs> it's a real pain. Yeah, actually, so we had one set of servers that um we moved from you know one building to another um and you know basically to get some more life out of them for a slightly different project and in the new location they were taking you know some of the machines would take ages and ages and ages to boot up or does not boot up at all i finally figured out what was happening um the the servers had a very large number of hard disk drives and they would occasionally fail and then the raid controllers would be waiting for the disks to come online and some of them would just wait indefinitely some of them would eventually just time out and give up so what i realized that if i unplugged all the hard drives then the servers would boot up much more quickly because <laughs> the raid controllers would be like oh there's no drives never mind <laughs> don't need to wait for anything so yeah i've never run into that problem where a, where a hard drive would prevent a server from even posting uh. What are you going to do? Yeah, I guess that's another thing with with modern um, modern computer firmware. This is not really limited to servers, but uh, you know, somebody brought me a laptop at one point that was just seemed completely dead. Right, you hit the power button and like nothing showed up on the screen. Um, in trying to diagnose it, I unplugged the hard drive and then tried to boot it up. Bang! Immediately, we got a Dell logo. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Apparently. The idiots that write it, that wrote the firmware didn't bother even trying to initialize the display in any way until they had already checked all the storage. It's like, <laughs> like, how the heck are you supposed to debug something like that unless you can display some kind of status information on the monitor? Like, <laughs> the whole thing with hiding error messages these days is just so annoying. It's like, oh, something happened. Okay, what happened? <laughs> that would be nice to know. Uh, so yeah, that's that's one of the things that I do whenever I get a computer. Turn off quiet boot. I want to see those messages. Because <laughs> if something breaks, then I might be able to do something about it. <clears throat> anyway, enough of an aside. None of this has anything to do with FPGAs. <laughs> This is just a crappy server firmware. Speaking of crappy firmware, I just saw a couple days ago a uh, somebody found a security vulnerability in UEFI buffer overflow that basically means oh, you yeah, can run yeah. code and ring minus two on like a whole bunch of different computers. <laughs> and since it's UEFI, you can't very easily update that, right? You got to update the system BIOS or something with the new version. Uh, and some of those, and if you have a machine that's out of support and the manufacturer's not releasing firmware updates, <laughs> what do you do? Not great. Not great. Anyway, enough of getting sidetracked. I'm not sure if anybody else has any questions or comments. Feel free to pipe up if uh, if anyone has anything you want to discuss. Or if not, then I guess we can adjourn for today. And um, well, the switch meeting is next week. If anybody's interested in the packet switch and what Carlos has been working on. You can also see Carlos is in a new lab. Um, had some shuffling yep. taking place at UCSD. So we got a pretty <laughs> nice optics lab uh, that we're going to be working in for the next few months here. So Carlos uh, yep. just got Carlos up. set up this week. So <laughs> with all of the uh, development machines and uh, network testers and that sort of thing. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what we can do to test the switch. <laughs> yeah, it should be good. Should be good. Um. Yeah. So the switch switch meeting is next week, and then the next kernel developer meeting that's that's going to be TBD. I got to figure out what my plans are for SIGCOM, and then it's it's probably going to be either one week before or one week after. Which one I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I guess. Let me see where this is. Uh... Maybe it would make sense just to do it July thirty first. Do it one one week before. Because one week after would be potentially conflicting with the switch meeting, right? So um that might make sense. That would probably be the simplest thing to do. Well, we'll ruminate on that. And if it makes sense, then then we'll do that. Because I gotta figure out I'm flying to Australia for uh for SIGCOM, I got to get the logistics for that figured out. <laughs> that's going to be long flights. So yeah. I don't know how the sure. timing for that's going to work out. We'll see. We'll see. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I guess we'll adjourn for today and uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks okay. for Thank you in. very much. Thank you all. Thanks. See you. Yeah.